Hi everyone and a warm welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent, transformational change and of course, tech as a force for good. I'm your host, Senator Sally Eves and in today's cyber special with Veritas Technologies, our focus is on cyber resilience and in particular, the need to move beyond zero trust to zero doubt. And we'll be discussing some breaking news announcements with benefits right across the multi-cloud landscape, an expanded security partner ecosystem, cyber cyber recovery and AI powered data management and simplification too. Lots to dive into here. And I know based on earlier conversations with both my guests today, it really will be a fireside that evolves as the subject does. So look out here for things today on the threat landscape, the advance of generative AI, skill needs and skill gaps, balancing compliance with innovation and much, much more. So let's get started. A warm welcome to the show, Tim and Varun. It's great to have you here. And firstly, perhaps over to you, Tim. Could you give a little bit of an introduction to yourself and your role and interests? Uh, my name is Tim Berlowski. I serve as a Senior Director of Product Management, and I have responsibility for cyber resiliency across Veritas, across our, our product and services portfolio, as well as our data protection strategy from a global perspective. And uh, I've been a Veritas uh, for several decades, I don't want to go any further than that. But uh, you know, my care about is really protecting the world's data, and that that hasn't changed for a long time. And really enabling our customers to scale to ever larger and increasing size and, and volume of data. On a personal perspective, I, I love photography. Definitely deep in 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 the tech landscape. So uh, I often find myself reading nerdy papers on the weekend and passing those along to my friends. So that's me. Love that. Shared interest there on the photography side as well. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. And Varun, over to you. Great to kind of follow on from our AWS conversations at reInvent as well. I'd love if you could just, again, bring a bit more about yourself and your role at Veritas to the fore, and also maybe about the education piece as well. Again, we had some follow-up questions on that specifically. Thank you, Sally. Great to be chatting with you again. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Varun Grover. At Veritas, I drive the go-to-market strategy for AI-powered cyber resilience solutions. I am deeply involved with our customers and partners to foster the adoption of generative AI in the enterprise. And outside of work, I run a YouTube channel called Generative AI with Varun, and I'm currently pursuing a master's in computer science, specializing in AI at Georgia Tech. I also love to hike in the Bay Area, and uh, I'm always game for hiking recommendations. Really excited for the conversation today. Love that. Love that. Again, love the kind of holistic range of interests as well. I think that's going to be really interesting later for kind of the diversity of skills and interests that makes a difference here too. So brilliant stuff. Thank you both. So let's get started again, really kind of drilling into what's happening in the world of cyber resilience. And I think what we're really seeing here is as the value and volume of data increases, so does its vulnerability, both from a data management, but also from a cyber security perspective too. The threats were continuing to increase in scope, scale, and of course, sophistication as well. So perhaps a great way to bring this together would be kind of what you will take at the moment about what's changed the most or what is changing the most in this field. I think for me, it could be a great kind of start of a 10, why we now need to move beyond a focus on zero trust to zero doubt for this more holistic, embedded and in spirits led cyber resilience approach. A long intro there, I appreciate. But again, I think it really kind of helps to set the scene of where we are right now. Tim, if I could go to you first on this one. Sure. And from my perspective, um, the, the world of data protection, really meaning backup and recovery, was always about protecting it from disasters. And they could be tiny disasters, like I deleted a file. They could be large disasters, like, whoops, my data center fl flooded. And so that's been a long story, you know, and, and we've always protected uh, customers in those circumstances. But in the last five plus years, suddenly cyber cybersecurity is the risk vector that people are thinking about. They're thinking about threat actors and what can happen in their environment. And and you mentioned the value of data, and I'll just say, you know, uh, there is this, this curious issue of, of why criminals decide to do something, and it's because the end result is value. And you know, famously, someone once said, why do you rob banks? I rob, rob banks because that's where the money is. Well, now where's the money? It's in the data that we're creating. It's the data about our customers, the ability to service uh, our customers, the ability to provide crucial government services. And so as that value is increased, that's where the attacks are headed. Now, what's happened more recently is those attacks are less about uh, malicious software and uh, traditional viruses that, that we might have thought about in the early 2000s and, and turned into 
uh, credential theft and turned into attacks on a user. And so that sometimes even administrative tools within the environment are, are used ag against uh, uh, systems that the, the customer depends on. And that that's changed things. The other thing is a focus on recovery. Meaning for years, people thought about the performance of backup. Am I being able to do as many backups as I want? Can I do it in a cost-effective way? But very little discussions about, about recovery. I'll, I'll, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, a long time ago, if I went to a major customer and said, look, here's how fast we can restore a thousand of anything. They'd look at me, cross their eyes and say, you know, I do like, you know, a thousand restores a year. Why would I ever restore everything all at once? That's a very different conversation today. Everyone exactly. wants to talk about, can I recover everything? And that's a top of mind issue, not just at like practitioner level, the board is asking. So true. Really, really interesting. I'm going to throw in another one there around collaboration as well as another evolving area. I think we're seeing it in two different ways. On, on the negative side, I think we're seeing more bad actors kind of come together in more sophisticated ways too and kind of reimagine some of the older threats. So again, it also brings to the fore back coming together more on the other side. And we're seeing good advances on that, I think particularly around education, but also say in the field of responsible AI. And again, perhaps want to come back to you a little bit later on in the show. Varun, I'd love to bring you in here as well. What are you seeing most in terms of what's changed or about to? So Sally, Tim shared some really great anecdotes there. I think for me, there's two really important themes. The fact that the attacks are becoming more human-centric and the rise of AI. Uh, just recently, Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI released their seventh annual AI index report. And it's a fascinating read. It dives into the rise of multimodal foundation models and the surge in investments into, into generative AI. Last year alone, $25 billion were poured into this field. And so this explosion in both technology and funding has transformed data management. And we're not just seeing more data as, as Tim uh, spoke to the increase in the value and the volume. We're actually dealing with data that's more complex uh, and consequently more vulnerable. And so as these data volumes and values increase, so do the sophistication and scale of potential cyber threats. That's why at Veritas, we're advancing our strategies from zero trust to zero doubt and integrating security deeply at every touch point to keep pace with these changes. You know, I'm going to add something there, Varun, which I think is kind of interesting because uh, Sally said collaboration. And that's another trend in the industry, which I'm super happy to see, which is uh, the traditional worlds of backup and recovery, which is very IT focused and the world of security are starting to come together. And we're seeing that both in terms of, uh, you know, actual org charts uh, and and reporting structures, uh, but also people, how people consume uh, backup and recovery and think about uh, business continuity. And increasingly, the security teams are working hand in hand with, with those backup and recovery practitioners to get to a great end result. And sometimes that means they're also able to use a consistent tool set so they can see the bigger picture. Meaning I, I can surface up threats to the, the backup environment that we're seeing, but if I combine that with the rest of the enterprise view, it, it becomes very powerful. Well said, Tim. Visibility is everything. Absolutely. I think it brings to the fore again, it's this unification piece, isn't it? That you're both bringing it to the fore. It's around data protection, security, and also governance, which I know we'll come on to later as well. And it's kind of making that kind of gap free, holistic approach to cyber resilience. So I love both those examples. And Bruin, did you have a second one you wanted to bring to the fore there as well? Yeah. So I, I think uh, one of the things that we've certainly seen is that there's, there's definitely um, a need for teams to to keep up. Uh, so so you're starting to see that IT organizations are stretched thin and wear many hats. So that makes them a prime target for credential-based attacks. In fact, we've definitely seen a rise in those sort of attacks in the recent years. And, and what's scarier is many also lack the sufficient training that they need to defend against these attacks and, and secure their data. Uh, according to a recent study, 45% of teams lack security skills and 29% lack data protection skills. And so that's opening up a skills gap and, and there's a need to solve for that. And, and I think uh, we'll certainly have the opportunity to talk a lot more about that as we go further into the show. Absolutely. I think alongside that as well, I think we're talking about issues, not just as training. I've yet absolutely come back to that shortly as well. Couldn't agree more strongly, but you made me think there as well about other um, kind of cultural 
um, and development issues as well. For example, some of the overload issues we're seeing in operational teams as well. Um, support there. I think we've come to the four two. So definitely come back to that. But brilliant. I think start of a ten there. I think again, if we can bring together some more examples of this. So where you're both kind of working with partners and customers alike and seeing the most need for support. Again, I think we're already seeing some recurrent themes and a few I'd bring to the fore are kind of very much across vertical based as well, which I think really brings to the fore complexity in many different ways. So one is the diversification in types of threats that we're seeing. I think I gave an example of that through collaboration earlier too and bringing back some of the older threats like Emitech, for example, and some of the older telecom protocols. So definitely that diversification and approach, but also when you just mentioned it as well skill needs and in particular around what we're seeing around generative AI and also um, getting past some of the misinformation around this area too so again love to drive into that we mentioned experience already but certainly compliance and again some of the geographical differences we're seeing but also where we're seeing duplication across legislation too so I'd love to drill into that but certainly those are the areas that come to the fore in some of the work I'm doing right now so over to you both and perhaps Varun first what are you seeing most in terms of areas where people are coming for most support right now? Absolutely. So I, I think, uh, Sally, we just talked about how there there is that skills gap and whether you are a seasoned veteran or uh, new to the IT organization, uh, there are a number of challenges around keeping up with not just the complexity in data, but also the sophistication of the attacks. And one way to close this skills gap is through an operational assistant to empower your team so they aren't struggling to optimize their environment. And we at Veritas are are super excited about a recent addition to our portfolio, Alta Copilot. And this new tool is a testament to how seriously we take the increasing complexity of data management. And this is something that our customers have been really looking forward to for some time, and we're excited to to bring it to them through our proprietary Alta View platform. And so Alta Copilot, powered by Generative AI, isn't just another tool. It's designed to proactively manage, simplify, and secure our customers' data environments. It's almost like having an AI expert on hand helping to identify potential vulnerabilities and streamline operations, and thus closing the data management gaps that many businesses face today. So that's where we are super focused today. Sally is solving for our customers in terms of the challenges that they're facing today and using AI for good. Love that. I think facilitation really coming to the fore there as well. It's that power of partnership and working alongside and I've had a lot of personal experiences of that as well. So that active listening to, to the problems, I think it's so, so key. And I wanted to put out a shout out for that because that's something I've experienced firsthand. Thank you. And, and Tim, over to you. What are you kind of being asked about most right now? Well, you know, people, people when, when they think about what, 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 what they're asking me, it, they're asking for proof that they can recover at scale. And they're doing that because an auditor, a regulator, or just their own fears about the worst case scenario are triggering that. But I I kind of, you know, want to dig into the questions behind the questions, which is that data vulnerability gap that we've been talking about that Varun mentioned, there's, there's demographic implications of that, meaning uh, there, there is a workforce uh, that in some cases is aging, getting ready for retirement. And, and as we have seen the, the volume of data increase, uh, most IT organizations are, are keeping relatively flat budgets. And if you just, you just kind of look at that, you've got a, a one class of people retiring, new people coming up through the ranks, uh, the, the problem space has increased, but it's the same number of humans. Well, it means we have to augment and extend human capability so they can do more. And frankly, uh, I, we're seeing more generalists uh, really getting involved in these operations, which means they need that assistance that, that Varun talked about. I get more excited about what this means in the future because we've been talking about more autonomous operations where you can have the machine make decisions for you and we've already got great proof points around that around things like detection of anomalies in your data or anomalous uh, behaviors that administrators might be engaged in to really understand user behavior and so i kind of think that the, the the core of our announcements is all about really the user, assisting the user, detecting odd user behaviors, making sure they're not a a threat actor and they're really who you think they are. And those are kind of the themes that I see. And those kind of tie back to that big question. Am I going to be able to be confident in my recovery when the time comes? 
and that's our message. You know, if you if you deploy the latest technology from Veritas, if you're if you're tuned into what we're doing, we're enabling you to have zero doubts, uh, and and that's that's the the big piece of of what we're getting to for our customers. That autonomous uh, system that that gives you high confidence. Love that, Tim. Thank you. Really, really appreciate that. And you've kind of lent me to where I was going to go next, actually, in our conversation in terms of. Another area, I mean, we see it everywhere, everywhere, don't we, in terms of headlines around particularly generative AI at the moment. And from every kind of role type, and you know, it could be from a developer point of view, it could be more from business practice, there's an impact here right across roles. And again, we see kind of words like juxtaposition, don't we, or the dual role of AI within cybersecurity. There's an opportunity and a threat kind of proposition here. And I'd love to drill into that. Again, we can see that from a data management perspective, but equally from a cybersecurity lens as well. So perhaps for, to you for information first on this. Let's explore a little bit about where you so, think. So Sally, uh, we, we've talked about this before. I, I like to say that chat GPT broke the internet in 2022. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's really fascinating. It, it became the fastest growing application in history, uh, hitting 100 million users in just under two months, I believe, which is faster than a number of the social media applications, even like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat even. And, and so I think it's, it's very clear that generative AI is reshaping how we think about technology and it's driving innovation at an unprecedented pace. Like I personally feel like every time I log into LinkedIn, there's a new foundational model that's been announced mm-hmm. or a new way of fine tuning or a new way of uh, using the model for your specific enterprise use case. So I think that the sheer pace of innovation is breathtaking. It, it takes me back to uh, when the PC first was introduced or, or the iPhone or, or the internet. And so this is a generational transformation. Uh, but it's really important to think through what the the flip side and the challenges are and, and what it really would be uh, what would really be necessary for enterprise rate adoption? Because uh, I, I think there was a Gartner study that came out that showed that uh, almost 80% of CIOs wanted to adopt um, generative AI by, by last year, but only a third have actually succeeded. So it's not just about understanding the high level benefits. It's also about understanding the intricacies and and how to actionably use this technology in your environment and in for your customers. And so, for instance, uh, at Veritas, we've been working on this uh, YouTube series called Explore AI, where we break down foundational content in uh, generative AI. So recently, we discussed the nuances of large language model pre-training, fine-tuning, and retrieval augmented generation. And these videos break down how small adjustments in the fine-tuning phase can significantly impact the model's output and security. So it's really important to think through all sorts of deployments very holistically, especially from a lens of data security. And this level of detail is crucial because as generative AI becomes more embedded in our operations, the potential for unique cybersecurity challenges increases. I've seen a number of... uh, papers come out around things like data leakage or or prompt injection. And so those aren't the only threats tied to large language models. There are a lot more. And so we must continuously monitor and adjust our security strategies to protect these advanced AI systems from emerging threats and ensure that they remain robust and reliable tools for innovation. Uh, And and that's how we can then holistically uh, and securely deploy these in the enterprise. Fantastic examples there as well. I, I think a few others that spring to mind for me that are quite specific here, for example, the rise in machine learning poisoning as an example, um, but also those specific challenges around LMs, for example, how the training is being done, the different kind of variety of open source um, kind of channels in to be able to using these, I think is really interesting. And you mentioned a number of research studies there, Varun. And I think, again, if you put all those together, we're seeing a few different intention and action gaps coming to the fore here. So, for example, the increased investment around AI, for example, that's not in pace with the increased investment around training and skills. I've seen some really interesting things there. For example, increased access to different sandboxes for, for testing environments, but again, without the skills piece for, for skills uplift. So, it's, again, getting that balance right, I think, is absolutely key. So, I love those examples. Examples and Tim, love to bring you back in here as well from oh. your perspective from where we're heading well, here. I, I'll just say, you know, all corporations are racing to figure out how to implement AI. 
Um, e even, you know, if they're they're not willing to, uh, you know, buy products with AI incorporated in it for for regulatory or compliance reasons, they are trying to develop their own techniques to make use of the technology because everyone sees this massive leap forward. Um, you know, I think we've all had this experience of working with ChatGPT and getting an answer instead of a list of things that might contain an answer. Huge difference. And we're willing to put up with lies and hallucinations because it's so magical. And, and that, so there's that race to implement. And then at the same time, there is a, a, a struggle to regulate that's happening, you know, a government policy, you know, uh, across the globe. And then I'll just say the malicious actor has no constraints. They are implementing and they don't care about the regulations. Uh, so they're, they're coming for all of us and our data. And uh, we, we have to make sure that we have defended ourselves against uh, what, what's coming. And it's tricky. I mean, we've all heard the, the news stories about, you know, some sort of fake video that causes a payments clerk or a grandma to send money to somewhere it shouldn't be. And it, it's, we all feel this sense of, well, I, I, I could fall for that myself. And, and that's a, just a terrible outcome. So it's going to be a tricky world to navigate. And, um, you know, it, it'll be fun to watch it unfold because it's, it's, it is a generational change. It really is. And I was doing a mentoring session literally the other day um, and you made me smile when you were talking about that and chat GBT, a really interesting example. Um, I was speaking to, to, to this um, a young teenager and they were talking about how for English, they couldn't quite get the style that they were being asked to write in you know, for, for a certain poet, for example. And they'd actually put in examples of the poetry also examples of feedback. And for the first time ever, they'd actually learned through that process around writing in the style of, and it's such an interesting example of it being used in, in really effective way. Um, so yeah, it really is changing things um, at so many different levels. And again, on the education piece, I think maybe one area we don't talk about as much, for example, is actually the use of, of AI specifically to help people learn in a, in a kind of smarter way, kind of identifying learning styles and kind of working with you, again, that facilitation approach. So seeing some exciting things in organizations looking at more personalized kind of training programs bringing in AI to do this and that brings me up back to room really wait wait um, wait, wait i i have to tell you my own experience there Sally. Go for it, I, mean, I, love it. I i had this moment where i i had a new boss he came from a a well-known consulting agency that has a well-known communication style. I hate to mention it, but it's McKinsey. So it, that's who it is. And I had these early experiences with my, with my direct manager who kind of, um, he asked me a question, I give him an answer. And then he looks at me like, I didn't understand what you said. It's that picture of the dog with the cone on their head. They cock their head and they're like, what? And I had no idea what I was doing wrong. And I, I went to chat GPT and I started asking questions. And I said, please, uh, respond, you know, like a consultant from this organization using classic pyramid style. And all of a sudden these outlines started coming back. And then I realized, okay, this is very simple. I see how he wants to be communicated with. And those conversations went a hundred percent faster so that I would, I would walk him through the answer and he'd get it, repeat it back to me and say, great. Sounds perfect out of the office. And I'm like, wow, I won. And I, I had no idea what I was doing wrong to start with. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Love that. Lovely job telling examples. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And, and it made me think as well, just talking aloud there as well, we have to be really careful when we're talking about AI. Again, you see quite a lot of conflations, don't you, when generative AI and AI are used and obviously very different things. And I wanted to talk to you, Varun, particularly about this and the implications of everything we're talking about here for traditional AI. Because again, I think sometimes that's under, under kind of explored in this conversation, sometimes left behind. Absolutely, Sally. And uh, I, I just want to say uh, Tim's example made me smile because uh, I've played around with ChatGPT and asked it uh, to sound like a Gartner analyst. So McKinsey consultant also, also sounds fun. Uh, I'll steal that one for my next prompt. Uh, but I, I think for traditional AI, it's really fascinating. I, I think Tim talked about how the experience with ChatGPT was magical. I think the difference between generative AI and traditional AI is with generative AI, um, customers are actually able to touch and feel the AI. The reality is that traditional AI has been around for a really long time, like almost decades at this point. And uh, we don't realize it, but every time you do a Google search or someone serves you an ad on social media, that's traditional AI. It's been around for a really long time. It's just 
we don't think about it because it's on autopilot. And today we are using AI as a co-pilot. So, so I think the evolution of traditional AI has installed. It's continuing, but it's at a different pace compared to the rapid advancements in generative AI. And I think there is a very important consideration here that you don't always need uh, to use a Swiss knife for a very specific tool. Uh, so generative AI to me is a generalist and, and can do a lot of things really well. But sometimes uh, for certain tasks, a traditional AI model can actually perform really, really well and be a lot more cost effective. So traditional data sets are expanding and becoming more complex because they continue to get used. And so that does require an ongoing refinement of those models to handle new data types and scenarios. And so that is crucial for maintaining the integrity and relevance of AI applications in various industries. But the introduction of generative AI has introduced a layered complexity, particularly in data security, simply because of the sheer rate of adoption and the explosion in, in, um, in terms of how this is getting deployed. And so while traditional AI systems often operate within defined parameters, generative models can create or infer new data points every time you uh, run an inference. So let's say you ask ChatGPT a question or you use a stable diffusion model, you create net new content. And so that poses unique security risks. And so the distinction highlights why we must adapt our cybersecurity strategies. But at the core, I think there's still the need for foundational data security practices and things like role-based access control, which, which are not going away anytime soon and are equally important both with respect to traditional AI models and generative AI models. Excellent. Brilliant overview. Thank you so much. I think one other thing, I think you covered nearly everything there. The only thing else that sprung to mind there is more from the data management point of view of the differences too, in terms of kind of the data hungriness so to speak, between traditional AI and generative AI too as another difference area. So brilliant. Thank you so much for unpacking that. And maybe the next area, um, I know we've touched on it a little bit briefly earlier on, but it's around compliance. Again, I've just been at a big CTO event and this was one of the biggest areas that was coming through. And a lot of confusion there, A, across some of the differences across geographical boundaries, but the sheer kind of um, increase and in acceleration we're seeing across different areas. We've got lots of different derivatives, haven't we? We've got DORA, NIS2, um, CR, many others. Um, and what I'm seeing is a move towards more proactive risk management through this, but also more personal accountability. And this too, in particular, is bringing a lot of um, kind of well, move from transparency, should we say, to accountability to C-suite level. But I think some people aren't quite aware about how far that expands. So, for example, some of the impact of NIS2 is not just EU specific, particularly with supply chains and the expanded criteria. It really is a global um, impact proposition. And the actualization of this, I think October 24th, we're really hitting kind of where we have to be on that. Also, there's a lot of duplication I'm seeing across regulations. So some organizations, I think particularly interesting for smaller ones, may actually have done some of the work here and can reuse what they've done. So, so much happening there. And I'd love to kind of bring to you both, how can we support organisations really of all sizes evolving this landscape and kind of reducing some of this doubt? And um, perhaps to you, Tim, first, if I may. Well, that's a big area. And I'll just say that that area of regulation always reminds me of, of one of my simple truths, which is there's two big threats to data. One is the malicious threat actors that we've talked about, and the other is the lawyers. And uh, as they move in with some significant policy changes, some significant compliance changes. I, I think it's been a, a phenomenal move for the industry where some uh, aspects of securing the enterprise, managing risk in the enterprise were kind of like a secondary function. Someone had a checklist, someone audited things, but it wasn't a board level conversation. It wasn't at the C-suite level. And so, you know, all of the changes you described are really getting the attention, which I think is key. Meaning uh, as, as uh, you know, a consumer of, let's say, a bank's services, I want to know that they will keep my money safe. Well, today that means they keep their electronic IT infrastructure safe. And I, I think that's a fantastic thing. And if you think about banks, I, I just mentioned it as a consumer notion, but banks ultimately are an important part of the economics for a whole country and the world. Uh, you know, so it's it's one of those things where we have to do it. And it, it gets just really interesting in this world where there's been some amount of decoupling in the world where uh, certain blocks of countries have, have started to develop. And uh, you see that in some of the, the cyber attacks that are, are published. Um, I, 
I am, I'm challenged with how do we make that easier for customers? And I, it, it comes back to great analytics and great uh, ability to analyze large sets of data and spot what you, what's important to work on. And as we think about where we're headed, you'll see us continue to develop key solutions in those areas. And very much, although I may tease my lawyer friends, those, all of those compliance regimes are so important to us all getting into a better state of confidence in our, our capabilities to have a resilient enterprise. Brilliant, brilliant overview. Thank you very much. And Brun, did you have any thoughts on this as well about where you're getting asked for support in this particular area? So Tim, Tim did a really good job of speaking to how uh, regulation is 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 critical in in this space. Uh, I, I'll drill deeper into the the rapid increase in AI related regulations here, Sally, and it's it's really fascinating because back in 2016 there was one regulation in the U.S. tied to AI. Now there's 25. In the last year alone, there's been upwards of a 50% growth in the US in terms of AI regulation. And, and the need for that is AI is imperfect and the rate of adoption is really, really fast. And so you're starting to see these models deployed in the enterprise. And I think it is really important for governments to be able to streamline how the adoption progresses, because uh, going back to one of the things that Tim said earlier, AI can be used for go both good and bad use cases. And so it really depends on in whose hands you're putting this transformational technology. And so it's really important to have some guardrails in place. And uh, at Veritas, we view these new regulations, not just as compliance, uh, compliance requirements, but as opportunities to enhance overall cybersecurity posture. More and more, I think cybersecurity and compliance are blending. And so by integrating compliance deeply with cybersecurity strategies, organizations can achieve more robust data protection frameworks. And so I think it'll make all of these companies that are deploying these large language models more transparent about how their training data is being sourced. Uh, how are they thinking through data privacy? How are they securing that data? And once an inference is generated, uh, is it secure? Is it uh, private? Is it ethical in terms of how the model is being deployed? Uh, are there fewer biases in place? So this integrated approach ensures that the compliance uh, aids in strengthening security rather than being a mere checklist of obligations. And so that can really help enhance overall cyber resilience. So I think we really welcome the increase in AI-related regulations because then that helps us continue to take advantage of this transformational technology, but ensure that there are more positives than downsides. Absolutely. Love those. Love those breadth of, of points there as well. And kind of as a follow on, I've actually just been doing a bit of a review around this too, um, around the impact of the EU AI Act as well, and kind of where the synergies are and how we can kind of better potentially balance the need to regulate alongside the need to innovate as well. So alongside the podcast, we'll share some links to that as well, because it again allows another kind of deep dive to continue these conversations too. So brilliant points both. And that was really my next area really about, and Tim, you mentioned it yourself earlier about bad actors don't have the same constraints. What are your thoughts about kind of balancing that better? And again, it's a big, big question and perhaps some the commercial AI would be an interesting way to kind of look at this. Well, uh, you know, it, Again, we, we we think about the threats all day long, and so what what bad things could happen? But but the truth is, uh, there's a, there's a, a extraordinary amount of energy going into the opposite side of the coin. And I'll just say, uh, while I am thinking about uh, at a at a at a major enterprise, what does it mean when someone has stolen credentials and a malicious threat actor has logged into the controls of a of a key system? And I I think. That's that's kind of a just like okay the different paradigm. How, if AI is being used against me, how would I spot it and defeat it? And and the key to me is that earlier point I made, like bringing in the right security uh, solutions into uh, a holistic view of the enterprise, so we understand at both the micro level what's happening and then can spot it across the entire enterprise. And I'll just give you a really simple example. If you were to log into a system which you are properly you know, credentialed administrator and take an action, 
Hmm, kind of interesting. What if you logged into 3000 systems? Oh, that's that's unusual. What if you uh, logged in from a different country than you'd ever been spotted in before? Hmm. And, and, and taking those signals, using AI to analyze them, to understand them, to pull the the needles out of the haystack of information at an average enterprise is just the key to making sure we can protect ourselves. And and I I, I, I tend to you know not be as engaged with the regulatory side, but I'll I'll tell you this. Um, we we think that everyone getting to a better cybersecurity posture is important and and just really crucial so you know we're we're thrilled that some of these regulations are getting more teeth because it's it's just good hygiene for everyone and it'll ensure business continuity at the same time when i think about you know how do we how do we you know continue to innovate that's where it's it's going to be interesting to watch this unfold because whatever we're regulating today may not be relevant tomorrow. And I, I think in general, laws have always lagged uh, technological innovations a little, um, but it'll be, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the government officials I've met in the US in particular, how well versed they are in AI technologies. And I even met military folks who were really thinking deeply about the privacy concerns around their camera systems and you know what's monitoring their bases. And again, their, their primary mindset you would think would be 100% focused on defensive measures, but the, the truth is they were also taking into account uh, the citizens in, in their country and how that would impact those citizens and how they should uh, keep and maintain that data. So it's kind of interesting to me how sophisticated uh, government and policy has been in this area, even though to, to many people, this, this AI world we, we suddenly found ourselves in uh, sort of sprang on us quite suddenly. Absolutely. And again, we can do a little bit of a follow on there as well. There's a Pacific think tank in the US that I work with that's kind of literally on what you were talking about, Tim, just there. So again, what we'll do is a little follow on because I love the fact that we can really kind of bring people to resources here as follow ons from this activity. So we'll do a bit of a shout out for some work that's happening here that, again, I think is very proactive in this particular space and shows that kind of depth of thinking and probably a new consciousness around privacy and some of these other considerations we've been talking about today. So I love that, Tim. It's great that you're seeing that in the work that you're doing as well. And again, brings me on to another aspect, I think, and really is to the fore about the human aspects of enabling cyber resilience at scale. And we've drawn into this, I think, so many times in our conversation today. It's about culture and it's about skills too. And I wanted to kind of bring a couple of examples to the fore. I think I mentioned earlier around the use of AI for skills support. And one example of that is things like metacondition. So it really helps people to identify like personal learning styles. I think the use of AI there can be really effective. And I've seen some great projects that have been scaled out in organisations that have really enabled people not just to have kind of new skills access and new literacy, but also the skills confidence to apply it as well. So some really effective things there, but also immersive learning around cybersecurity. So kind of moving beyond tabletop exercises and the use of AR in this space, for example. So so many things happening here. I'd love to kind of move on to this area a little bit more about what you're seeing done as well and things for the audience to consider from a more culture and skills perspective, particularly when we see some of the other challenges too around talent gaps. But I mentioned earlier around operational overload. Tim, you mentioned earlier as well around, in many ways, um, drilling into active intelligence with issues, for example, like alert fatigues and supporting um, people hands-on. So, so much happening here. Perhaps to Varun first, what is kind of capturing your eye from culture and skills for cyber resilience? Sally, you know this is close to my heart. We've, yeah. we've talked about this before, but uh, when when we talk about cyber resilience, it's it's not just a matter of technology. It's fundamentally about people, uh, and so. I think the rapid advancements in AI require not just new skills, but a new mindset. And I think in the past, uh, there was often um, a, a lot of conversation around fixed mindset versus growth mindset. But I think now that becomes more important than ever. Like Instead of being a know-it-all, you need to be a learn-it-all, right? And so at Veritas, we, we recognize that and we've been effectively managing uh, all of the demands for AI technologies that not necessarily just require technical know-how, but also it requires a culture that values continuous learning and adaptability because we are faced with an ever-changing transformational journey that um, requires you to think differently. Uh, we don't have all the answers and, and the technology itself is evolving at such a rapid pace. That's why we're actually investing heavily in training uh, for these AI technologies so that our teams are, can be prepared uh, both 
at an engineering le level as well as at a go-to-market uh, level to be able to deal with these realistic scenarios. And so these tools um, really help immerse our staff in experiences that prepare them for the real world challenges around generative AI. And so we're really working towards trying to address that uh, talent gap that we spoke to and ensuring that our teams are not only prepared, but also proactive in their roles. And not only that, we're also creating a lot of content to help our customers and our partners. So I spoke to earlier the YouTube channel that we have um, for Veritas Tech and the Explore AI YouTube series. In addition to that, we've actually put out a series of foundational content in terms of blogs. Uh, and we also have a community on Vox and a shout out to our team for setting that up uh, that really breaks down like fundamental questions like what is retrieval augmented generation? What is fine tuning? Why does it matter? And so with that, we're not just focused on educating our internal teams. We're also really focused on empowering uh, the teams that work with us uh, from our customers so that they can take advantage of this technology without necessarily being overwhelmed by the rapid pace of innovation, but can really understand what is actionable for them today. Love that. Sorry, Tim, I'll edit that little segue out. Sorry. Um, can I do one quick reflection and I'll bring you back in? Is that okay? Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Love that. And I, I wanted to put a shout out here as well. As I, I know I've talked about this a lot before, but the community around this as well. And you mentioned some of the blog content there as well. But again, I've been involved and seen personally as well, a lot of community outreach. So that's what I love too. Again, not just that internal focus on skills and skills uplift, but moving beyond that to and developing external talent so I wanted to put a shout out for that because I think that's so so important too um, particularly from a diversity perspective so love that and Tim love to bring you back in now as well well I was just so excited about what Varun was saying and it's one of these things where I'm always coaching my own team that although we're a technology company and we spend all of our efforts in deeply technical discussions with our customers, solving big, important problems. Ultimately, we all solve human problems. And, and, and Varun is absolutely correct. We have to have a, a, a growth mindset. But I'm going to just bring it to a slightly different angle, which is as we implement uh, the AI-empowered experiences, uh, I'm thinking deeply about how we make it as transparent as possible. And I'll, I'll just say, I, I think many of us have had the experience of, of using a technology like Alexa from Amazon or uh, you know, maybe Siri uh, from Apple. And people who you might not think as technical savants just jumped in and started doing it. My own parents, like they, they set reminders and alarms and create lists. And I never had to sit down and say, let's have a learning session about AI but they were engaging with it in a way that felt comfortable to them. Hey, take a, take a, 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 a you know, a, a, a grocery list and, and add this to my grocery list. And, and it felt as natural as having a conversation with a human. And as I think about that long-term, the, we need to take a very human centric approach to developing interfaces to, to our products and guide people along in this journey as we go from, you know, everything being human mediated, step-by-step, -step, file a ticket, take an action, close the ticket to uh, creating automation, uh, creating dynamic behaviors, allowing behaviors that are much more autonomous. And, and in that journey, making it really simple. I mean, go watch a movie from a century ago and, and all the steps it took to start a car. It was, <laughs> it was a procedure. Well, now it's like a button, you know, you don't even think about it. No one has a manual on how to do that. And that's the kind of thing we need to do. We incorporate the technology, simplify, but, but package it up in a human centric way. So people aren't really having to even engage with, I'm learning a new way to do it. They're just like, oh, this is better. And they, away they go. Oh, that's brilliant. And you gave me a really happy memory there, Tim, as well. I was going back to childhood there in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with doing that whole, you know, cleaning up the car, <laughs> around, 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 and rescuing them. Brilliant, brilliant. But you're right. Simplification is key. And, and on a different note, you reminded me of some other research I, I was a, a kind of principal investigator on. Um, and it was bringing to the fore how that adoption of new technologies and the example you we were talking about with your parents there kind of sprung to mind um, as well and about that familiarity um, being a big, big influencer in terms of confidence to adopt as well. So some really interesting data around around that. So, again, that'd be another thing I think we can do as a call to action for people to find out more on, too. So great example there. Love that. And I know we're kind of running short on, on our time here today. So I wanted to bring you back in, Tim, as well, just to. 
um, kind of bring together a few of the thoughts we've, hit, we've had today. And I know there's some big news coming in kind of the expansion of Veritas 360 Defence, um, some new news, kind of three key pillars, I like to call it, around new cyber capabilities, new um, additions around your partner ecosystem and cyber recovery. And of course, we've talked about a lot today around AI powered innovation as well. Tim, I wondered if I could hand it over to you to give a little overview of some of the breaking news there. Absolutely. So happy we made these announcements. It's It's been a long time uh, in creating these uh, advancements. So first of all, I'll, I'll highlight our new cyber detection capabilities, which are really built around our ability to understand anomalies in the data and also what actions the administrators are taking. And this has one goal in mind, make sure that you're ready for a confident recovery of your data. And it really doesn't matter how you're protecting your data. It could be uh, in the enterprise in a traditional data center. It could be in cloud. It could be across clouds. It could be with, uh, you know, software as a service where you're also having to recover, back up and recover that data. So. Very excited about what we bring to bear there. Uh, we've also expanded our security partner ecosystem. Uh, same goal in mind. We have to give people a confident zero doubt cyber recovery. And uh, we've done more with our, our security uh, uh, ecosystem vendors uh, to make sure that the user is who we think they are and they have the right intents. Uh, I'll also tell you, we, we've released a great cyber recovery checklist for those companies who may feel like, I'm not sure where to start. We've given them some easy easy tips to where you can start. And if you've already started, where you can use uh, our technologies to go deeper and produce a better, more confident result. Lastly, I mean, we can't get away from AI. The idea that we have now with Alta Copilot, a great assistant who can help uh, you manage uh, our solutions in an easy way to troubleshoot, to understand what's happening, that's great, but it gets even better with our new natural language report generation. Uh, everyone has to generate reports. Maybe it's for their boss, maybe it's for a peer, maybe it's for billing, doesn't really matter, but being able to, to describe what you want in the end result and you don't get a, a template, you get data. And that's really how people want it to work. And so it'll be very exciting to see how, how customers respond to that. And we've already got some great enhancements happening in the lab. So it's gonna get better and better as we go. Fantastic, love that. I'd love to see where that's coming next, particularly from that lab perspective as well. And Rune, I'd love a kind of final thought from you on that as well. What's kind of been, you know, excited you most about what's coming to Thor here? So Tim did a fantastic job of summarizing all of our really exciting announcements there, Sally. So for me, uh, I think the part that I'm most excited about is that all of these announcements essentially help make our customers' workdays more manageable, their data more secure, and their decisions more informed. And so we're trying to offer solutions that are not only reactive, but proactive. And so we're predicting potential security issues and mitigating them before they become threats. And I think that's a game changer. I couldn't agree more. And again, it's that interesting combination of holistic kind of full life cycle approach to this, but also an incredibly integrated or unified way. I, I couldn't agree more strongly. And I know we're coming to a close. So I'm going to say maybe a 30 second like round robin style, if I may. If you had to kind of share maybe a final takeaway advice, something to kind of action on to think about kind of straight after this episode, make it really actionable. Wonder what that would be. Um, Tim, could I go to you first, if I may? Sure. It's time to get proactive and in the world of enterprise software and being ready for confident recovery, nothing matters more than getting to current. Upgrade your systems. It's time for that upgrade you've been putting off. Too many people say it is what it is. Instead, I think about it will be what we want it to be. And if you want a confident recovery with zero doubts, time to take advantage of what, what's already there. Awesome. Brilliant. Varun, over to you. So well, one of my favorite quotes from Spider-Man is with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's very true with AI. Uh, as we continue to innovate with AI, the balance between leveraging new technologies and securing them becomes increasingly delicate. The reality is that your AI strategy is as good as your data management strategy. And so my advice is to embrace generative AI, but with a robust cybersecurity mindset. It's essential to integrate advanced security measures from the start rather than as an afterthought. And so ensuring that each step forward in the innovation is matched with a step forward in security. 
And so this proactive approach will be key to maintaining trust and safety in AI powered solutions. So I really, really encourage everyone to start learning about generative AI, but more importantly, thinking about how their data management strategy can enable a successful foray into generative AI. Fantastic. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. A, the, the examples also we've brought to the fore today, I think that really makes a difference. We see that all the time in the feedback that we get here as well. So A, I love the fact that it's been kind of impact packed in terms in terms of examples. Um, and the holistic nature for me of cyber resilience has come to the fore around technology, but also around culture, skills and education. And there are steps that you can take today. You mentioned the cyber rec recovery checklist there, Tim, and that's what I wanted to bring to the fore as well. Whatever organisation you size you are, the steps you can take right now, plus there are a lot of opportunities around collaboration to move forward further together from cyber threats to areas like responsible AI. And again, we're going to be following up with everybody with some of the great projects and examples we've discussed today. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Ron. It's been great to spend time with you. And thank you all for watching and listening too. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tomorrow's Tech Today. If you enjoy what we're doing, please subscribe to us and leave a review. It really means a lot. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube. Thanks for listening.